This series of videos introduces the 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. It's a project of the Social Change Lab, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Mary Lee bequest for the work of our team. Hi, everyone. I'm Winifred Lewis. I'm a professor in psychology at the University of Queensland. Hey, guys. I'm Austin Manchotti. I'm a research assistant on this project. Hey, everyone. I'm Lyndon Ewan. I'm a student of psychology at the University of Queensland. And what we're doing today is we're recording introductory videos for each of the chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. And in particular, today we are looking at chapter 15, and that's called Political Consumerism and Food Activism. The author is Jasmine Lorenzini, and Jasmine is a research fellow at the Institute of Citizenship Studies at the University of Geneva. She works on food activism, political participation, and social movements, and uh, as well as unemployment and protest. I guess one question that people would have from the title is what is political consumerism, eh, Linda? Yes, so um, I guess political consumerism, it's, it's mainly about buying or refusing to buy products and services for um, political reasons. So Micheletti um, defines it as an attempt to influence politics through consumption choices. So they're kind of individualized collective form of um, political participation in the sense that um, it's performed at an individual level at a, in a flexible kind of way, um, but disconnected from political groups. So that can be um, an example might be um, buying fair trade group goods or buying organic food or participating in local services. Um, other examples can be engaging in community supported agriculture, um, things like that. Um, I guess the benefits of that is that you don't, as I've mentioned earlier, you don't have to be part of a political group, but you can be involved in an individual level and it's really good for education in the sense of, of, of that level. Um, but there are a lot of criticisms with political consumerism as well. Um, I guess, um, you know, it can create unequal access to political consumerism due to the purchasing power. Um, you know, I guess yeah. might be, you know, um, organic food might be much higher price point and, and not, not be available for everyone. Um, other issues would be the crowding out of other forms of participation. So I guess it can seem that it's, it's um, a lighter form of political action. Um, I think it's more like if you buy like free range eggs, then you're not ensuring that the battery hen uh, factories are closed down. So it's like you yeah. think that by doing the individual action, you've done um, something, but that can prevent you from taking action or society from taking action on the ongoing problem. That's right. Yeah. Um, as well as the commodification of um, political values, um, the retreat of the state. Yeah, can you say what that means? I'm sure people won't really know what that means. Oh, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> okay, I'll say it. So it's like yeah. the idea here is that in a way the whole idea of political consumerism like privileges your money and comes from the idea that people should mostly be understood in terms of their money. And so um, it, you know, from this perspective, everything turns into something that you buy and sell and your own politics and your attitudes kind of get channeled into that as well. So some people just think the whole ideology of political consumerism is too much based on the market and not enough looking at the state as a political actor that has values that include economic growth, but also other things like justice. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. I'll just jump in and say, um, like some of the things that uh, the author comments is that the impact of the political consumerism is going to really change based on what form it is. So they talk, or Jasmine um, Lorenzini talks about how one way that you do political consumerism is turning everything into a purchase or a sale, which again has this implication of, um, you know, commodification. Another part of political consumerism that can be problematic for some people is the idea that it is about being threatened by pollution and degradation and trying to buy something that's pure and unspoiled. So when you buy bottled water or organics, it's like the world is out there, it's kind of poisoned with chemicals, but you as a rich person will buy the more expensive products and be safe. And um, that is you know, all part of that same logic that people criticize. 
But there's a couple of other parts that are um, different, and that can include making deliberate political choices like boycotts. And this can be part of ongoing campaigns by environmental NGOs and political actors. And also um, making a decision um, for lifestyle choices, uh, for example, going vegan, that is beyond money and that doesn't involve necessarily, um, you know, um, turning everything into a monetary choice. So something like going vegan, it can be done for um, saving money, but usually it's done for moral reasons, moral and political reasons. And so the author talks at length about this concept from um, Wright of real utopias, where people can create transformations by putting forward alternatives to the status quo. And they will be effective in changing the system if they do one of three things. They can change the relationship of people who buy to people who produce. They can change your political understanding and the broader society's understanding of the state and how it works. And they can directly empower or weaken um, different groups in society like farmers. And so um, when we look at the way that the, um, the political consumption choices are made, those different forms of action have really different trajectories. I guess um, people choose different you know, behaviors and, and tactics because they have different theories of change as well. And that's something the author talks about, A. Eh, Austin? Yeah. So they go through this, the, the six theories of social change, essentially. First one's called transcender theory, which argues that change can happen because ideas spread. So underpinning this conception, you know, is the idea is the threshold. And once many people adhere to the idea, it changes overall society's thinking. You know, what the, the goal is always to the goal is obviously to trigger global massive change through rational thinking. The second one is educator theory, which builds on the communication of facts and reasoning to accompany change. They believe in power of fact, but they see it as slow and incremental. Intellectual theory, which is the third one, shares the core beliefs of educator theory as the process, again, is slow and incremental one step at a time. And then political theory or politician theory is that the predominant conception of social change in society and the goal is to build majorities in the parliament and therefore pragmatic policies are required to win over the elites. You know, realism, feasibility and compromise will prevail, essentially. Second, lastly, protest theory, in which social change on a more confrontational approach you know, using protests and things like that is, is attempted to disrupt the course of action, things like protests and whatnot. And finally, profit theory relies on the idea of regeneration at the individual level. So specifically how you can transform yourself individually through your decisions and what you do. Yeah, and I'll probably clarify because as you were speaking, I realized it sounds exactly the same. We're talking here about P-R-O-P-H-E-T. So not financial <laughs> profit, but the kind of religious theory that um, you can affect change through personal transformation. And there's really all different examples of that, eh, Linda? Yeah, there's a lot of different examples that um, the author speaks about. Um, so she speaks about reinventing production and consumption. Um, an example of that is um, she uses the examples of voluntary simplicity and eco-feminism. So voluntary simplicity, um, it's a lifestyle, lifestyle choice that's kind of um, defined by three core principles. So it has to be based on free will and the deliberate choice to live a simpler life. And there's also a clear focus on changing and reducing consumption at the individual or household level, and also an attempt to possess fewer material goods accompanied by um, a quest for meaning. So um, just living more simply, um, simply basically. Um, other examples was um, there's vegans, but also the extension of that is freeganism. So it, it's much more... Um, radical way it's um you know an example of that is you're not being involved in the market or you're not you're limiting purchases as much as possible um you might be going like dumpster diving is an example of that so finding um what other businesses see as waste and and using that um, um i would say like that might not be an extension of veganism per se and that hardly any vegans become freegans but it is like a, a kind of radical um philosophy that that you know springboards off the idea that we should withdraw from the capitalist system of buying and selling and i guess the point of all of that and eco-feminism which is about challenging the idea that we should only value um, making objects and not value making life and babies and reproduction and, and raising families, um, that those, those concepts are 
ways of changing how you live, um, but also they could have political transformation down the track. And this is in the broader context of, you know, all social movements, but the author highlights a specific domain of activism called food activism. What is food activism, Austin? Good question. So from the chapter, it says food activism focusing on a single issue to expand our understanding of social change is the subsection name. Mm. And essentially it says, you know, it includes all action forms that aim in transforming food production, distribution, and consumption. So this could be things like lifestyle changes, choosing to be vegan or buying free range eggs or whatever, or corporations changing how they're creating um, their products and selling them. And it, it's, it's quite a large, broad term, but mm. it includes political consumerism and it goes beyond this to form an action since it covers the actions of everyone, people and organizations that establishes long-term relationships between producers and consumers, you know, it, for example, you can do, I believe it's called farmer's boxes. Where yeah. You pay grocery or you pay like a monthly subscription fee and you get the groceries delivered at a discounted rate but you're getting them directly from the farmer yeah which supports that connection and it, it tries to bring together consumers and producers to create alternative food chains you know removes all the the industrial side of things makes it a little bit more easier however scaling is very important like it's great for people to be involved but it's very hard to have it at a huge scale done for you know hundreds of thousands of people in society yeah but um, it finishes off by saying like lifestyle politics are laboratories of social change. You know, for example, if you think of vegan citizens, that's become really, really popular in the last five years, probably it's because, you know, one person at a time and it's growing and eventually it might be all of society. Yeah. And that's the idea that the author comes back to like people might criticize those individual lifestyles, but when enough people do it, it changes business practices in ways that really matter. So for example, we've seen around the world, the introduction of plant-based um alternative foods in fast food chains. And that's really transformative um, when it starts to hit major uh, production companies. And if people will change the way that they, um, they produce their goods, for example, around palm oil or chocolate um, or coffee to make it more sustainable, then consumer choices have had a powerful positive effect. And I guess for me, that was the lesson of the chapter when I look at what overall I took from it. I think I probably was relatively dismissive in the past in terms of how I approached those um, individual choices. And the author, you know, goes through the criticism and says, yes, it's true. Companies can exploit this. They can, you know, use misleading labeling. They can greenwash their unsustainable practices by putting a little green frog or something positive. So you think you're doing the right thing. And, and there, there are problems, but the reality is there are also problems with politics. The state has been really ineffective. A lot of the pressures that people have invested in trying to get governments to change just haven't had the beneficial impact. So political consumerism is, is not just a surrender to the market. It's people who feel like the state has been weak and pitiful trying to get the market itself directly to act. And that can be transformative, the author said. I think I believed them by the end. What about you, um, Austin? What was your take-home point from the chapter? I think for me, the biggest thing was it, it just explained and I finally understood how making decisions just small things particularly on consumerism actually have impacts on society yeah because it's not really something you think about you know you you buy the brands that that support the right things you know you don't you, you try and do the right thing you know you never really mm. think oh but well, how is this going to actually have an impact you just think it's one step at a time but this shows yeah. and through like the, the changes the theory of changes and food actors and all that shows like look it works like this you start here and you do this and eventually if you do enough things right you get to save society essentially yeah save the planet as well yeah. that would be nice <laughs> what about you linda what was what did you take from the chapter very similar thing actually like um you know um everything seems to be on such a small individual level and um you know i think that's where i kind of sit most mm -hmm. of the time so it's important to you know um resist that greenwashing or um go beyond that maybe consume less and, and not because you're purchasing all the right things that that's the right thing to do. So um, I think this chapter has really challenged me to sort of, yeah, go beyond that and, and think beyond just you know, <laughs> decisions in the moment. Well, I'm sure the author would be really pleased to hear it. So that's a great place to finish. I'll, I'll just say thank you to you, Linda, and to you, Austin, for participating in the recording. And thank you to our viewers, if you've made it to the end of the video. Bye now. For those of you watching, be sure to subscribe and follow us at Social Change UQ.
and check out our website for more videos.